Okay, here we are. Hello, uh, welcome to the National Blood Clot Alliance's Facebook Live event, Pregnancy and Thrombophilia. I'm Leslie Lake and I chair the National Blood Clot Alliance. I'm also a culinary and blood survivor. Today's discussion will be led by Dr. Rachel Rosofsky, whose bio is, uh, Dr. Rosofsky, Rosofsky is a hematologist at Massachusetts General Hospital and an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. She serves as the Director of Thrombosis Research for the Department of Hematology. She earned her undergraduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania, her medical degree from Harvard Medical School, and her master's in public health from Harvard School of Public Health. She completed her residency at Brigham and Women's Hospital and her fellowship at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute. Dr. Rosofsky is on the board of directors of the National Pulmonary Embolism Response Team called PERT Consortium. And as part of this enterprise, she also serves as the chair of the education committee. She is on the executive committee of MGH PERT and is the creator and director of the MGH PERT multidisciplinary follow-up clinic, the goals of which are to improve the care of patients with pulmonary embolism as they transition from inpatient to outpatient setting. She is also on the executive committee for Venus, which is the Venus Thromboembolism Network US. Dr. Rosofsky has collaborated locally, nationally, internationally, with prominent researchers on the risk diagnosis and treatment of VTE, and she has published widely in this area. She is also the recipient of the MIT IDEAS Global Challenge Award for developing an affordable system to monitor anticoagulation in patients living in low-income countries. Through lecturing, research, and written works, she has sought to improve the care of patients with VTE and advance the understanding and treatment of this medical condition. Dr. Rosofsky is also on the Medical and Scientific Advisory Board of the National Blood Clot Alliance. Dr. Rosofsky will also be joined by her patient, uh, Kate LaFleur. Kate, and we want to thank you so much for coming here today and sharing your personal story. It means so much to all of us. And I'd also like to thank today's sponsor of our event, which is Ripples. Uh, this event will actually be the first of a series of three sponsored by Ripples. So please be on the lookout for more information about these upcoming events. And for all of you in attendance, please feel free to send your directly to the chat function. We will try to get to everyone's questions as best we can today. And finally, we are always trying to improve our communication efforts with our patient community. So if you have feedback on today's event and you'd like to share it, please email us at info at stoptheplot.org. And with that, I shall turn it over to Dr. Rosofsky. Well, thank you. Uh, so it's an honor and privilege to talk to you today about thrombophilia and pregnancy. So first of all, what is thrombophilia? Thrombophilia is an inherited or acquired condition that predisposes people to developing blood clots. So let's just take a step back. What is a blood clot? A blood clot occurs when something slow or changes the blood flow. The blood kind of thickens and clumps together and blood clots can form in deep veins, most commonly in a person's leg, sometimes in the arms or other locations. And that is called a deep vein thrombosis or a DVT. If that's untreated, that can move or break off and travel to the lungs, which can be life-threatening. And that's called a pulmonary embolism or PE. And DVT and PE are both types of what's called a VTE or venous thromboembolic event. So pulmonary embolism and DVT, why is this a problem? We know that there's over 900,000 VTE cases in the United States every year, and over 100,000 people will die of a PE. However, if you know your risks, you can actually take measures to prevent those risks. So what are those risks? Um, there are uh, surgery, hospitalizations, smoking, obesity, cancer, and of course, pregnancy. And um, it's important to remember um, that thrombophilia inherited or acquired is another risk factor. So there are currently, I'm just gonna speak about the inherited risk factors. There's actually five that we know about. One is called factor V Ludden. One is called the prothrombin G mutation. Another one is protein C deficiency, protein S deficiency, and antithrombin deficiency. Now, some are more frequent than others, and some carry a higher risk of developing a blood clot than others. For example, factor V Ludden is the most common inherited thrombophilic condition about one in 20 people will have this. And if you do have this, your risk of developing a blood clot is about three to four times higher than in the general population or in those that don't have factor V Leiden. 
Antifermin-3 is one of the most uncommon ones. About one in 600 to one in 5,000 people will have this inherited thrombophilic defect. But the risk of develop, developing a venous thrombobulic event, a DVT or PE, is about 15 to 30 times higher than the general population, i.e. those people that don't have antithrombin deficiency. So you can see that these thrombophilic defects are kind of split up into low risk types, which means people have them and have a lower risk for getting a blood clot, and then higher risk types, which means people that have those are at a much higher risk of developing a blood clot. So how is thrombophilia diagnosed and treated? Well, the first thing is who should we test for these thrombophilic defects? Now, routine testing for anybody that's had a blood clot with a diagnosis of VTE is not currently recommended, but there are very specific select populations that we should think about. Most experts agree that people who have a blood clot who have at least one first degree relative that also had a blood clot before the age of 50 should probably be tested for one of these inherited conditions. because There's a good chance that you have that one. Patients that have a blood clot, um, but without a family history, if those people are young, they've had recurrent blood clots or blood clots in unusual locations, and you don't know the reason for the blood clot, that's another group that we consider testing for. So when and what should we test for? So we already talked about those five inherited risk factors. When should we test people? Well, when someone has a blood clot, they're put on a blood thinner called an anticoagulant, and that's to treat the blood clot but these medications can actually affect some of the tests that I just mentioned, and it makes them unreliable. In addition, when you have a blood clot, it can actually reduce the concentrations in some of those proteins like protein C or protein S or antithrombin. So actually you get a false result. It's a low test, but it's actually not really low. Therefore, we recommend if you are considering getting tested um, that you do it not in the setting of an acute blood clot, but that you wait. And if you're someone that doesn't need to be on blood thinner for a long time, lifelong, you can do it when you stop your blood thinner. Of course, the two genetic tests, which are the factor five one and the prothrombin G mutation, those can be tested anytime. So if you have been discovered to have a thrombophilia, how should you be treated? Well, the answer to this depends on many risk factors, but essentially in patients who have an inherited thrombophilia, if they're gonna be at risk of developing a blood clot in high clotting risk situations, and in those situations, those are the times that we think about putting people on a blood thinner. And one of those high risk clotting situations is pregnancy. So pregnancy, even without thrombophilia has a risk of clotting. And there are many reasons for this. When you're pregnant, there's an increased tendency to clot during the pregnancy because it's the body's natural response to protect women against bleeding, especially that can happen during childbirth. In addition, there's all these hormonal changes that happen. Um, which can cause changes in blood flow, changes in blood volume, the concentration of the blood, and that can increase your clotting risk by about five times higher than those that are not pregnant. On top of it, you have this anatomical cause. You've got a huge belly, <laughs> this huge uterus that's pressing on your vessels. That's going to put you at risk. And the risk is actually greatest in the three months after the baby is born, called postpartum period, and also increases in people that need C-section. So women with inherited thrombophilia and pregnancy are at an increased risk of developing clotting problems because of their underlying inherited thrombophilia, as well as the risk of pregnancies and the pregnancy associated changes that I just mentioned. So women need to work very closely with their healthcare providers to assess what their clotting risk is when they're thinking about becoming pregnant or are pregnant. And the factors to take into consideration is, do you have an inherited thrombophilia? Uh, do you have a personal or family history of clotting? And do you have other medical problems or risks that might increase your risk of clotting? And the magnitude of your clotting risk during your pregnancy is really going to depend on whether the woman who's pregnant has a low or high inherited thrombophilic risk, or whether she has a personal or family history of a blood clot. So I know this is not a medical conference, but I do want to share <clears throat> one study that I think really highlights all the different risks for clotting for pregnant women, there was a recent review of 180 women who had a blood clot during their pregnancy, either during or after, and they had a DVT or PE or both. And they looked to see, well, what were the causes? What were the underlying risk factors? And they found that the most significant risk factor identified was whether the woman had a C-section. Almost 50% of the people that got a blood clot had had a C-section. The second biggest risk factor was obesity. Almost 40% of people were obese. 
the thrombophilia risk factor, about 10% of people that caught it had a thrombophilic defect. But interestingly, if you had a family history of blood clots, about 20% of people who had, blood, who had developed blood clot had a family history. So that is, I think, really important. It's showing that family history, even more importantly than the inherited risk factor, can carry a risk. And remember, I said there's five inherited risk factors that we know about. There are clearly many more that are out there. I can't tell you how many patients who come in and say, my mother had a blood clot, my grandmother had a blood clot, my aunt had a blood clot, <clears throat> and their testing was negative. Does that mean they don't have an inherited thrombophilic defect? Probably not. I'm pretty sure that they do. We just haven't discovered it yet. And fortunately, there's some new tests looking into identifying more of these thrombophilic defects, and that is much anticipated. So women who are planning to get pregnant or are pregnant should work with their healthcare providers to assess and manage their clotting risk. And this can absolutely be done successfully. So who should we treat <clears throat> if we identify a woman who's pregnant and has thrombophilia? So the goal of treatment with someone who's pregnant with thrombophilia is to prevent the woman from getting a blood clot. And the approach to this is a little bit controversial because there's lots of different guidance and guidelines that are mostly based on whether the thrombophilia is low risk, like that factor five Leiden, or high risk, like that anti-thromba deficiency. And if a woman has a high risk thrombophilia, then those women absolutely need to have blood thinner during and after their pregnancy. And remember, I told you that the risk is the greatest in the three months after the pregnancy. For women with low risk, it really depends on whether that woman has had a personal blood clot in the past or significant family history of blood clots. And sometimes we'll treat those people during and sometimes we'll treat them just after. The most important thing is to talk to your doctor about your risks and whether you need blood thinner during or after or both. So once we've decided that yes, you need to be on a blood thinner, what kind and what dose? Well, there's definitely safe therapies out there for pregnant women who, are, um, who need to be on a blood thinner. And they include something called unfractionated heparin, low microheparin, heparin, or a drug called Fondaparinox. You might've heard the drug warfarin that should not be used in pregnancy because that can cause harm to the fetus. And all these new oral drugs uh, like Riparoxaban or Zeralto or Apixaban or Eliquis, those have not been studied to, so we don't know if they're safe or effective during pregnancy or breastfeeding. So we don't recommend those. So what dose should we use when we're thinking about a blood thinner? Again, similar to who to treat, the dose varies depending on the guidelines. But in general, if you have a low risk thrombophilia, you could, not, you could probably hit, use a low dose blood thinner. If you have high risk thrombophilia, you probably need to be on a higher dose. But it depends again, if the patient's had a blood clot in the past. And sometimes there's a, a dose in between called the intermediate dose. So I helped conduct a survey of North American physicians um, and their practice patterns to kind of figure out what are people doing in practice? How, what, how are they prescribing and what are they prescribing to prevent pregnancy associated blood clots in women with thrombophilia? And there was a diversity of practices regarding whether you use kind of the low dose or the high dose or the intermediate dose. And fortunately, there's actually an ongoing trial called the high-low trial, which is actually going to answer this question as to whether or not low dose or high dose are needed in women who are pregnant with thrombophilia. So I think until we have those results, it's probably important for you to talk to your doctor to figure out what your risk is in the best approach. I think it's also important to note that if you're pregnant or you have an underlying inherited thrombophilia, that you have a multidisciplinary team of people that are taking care of you. That is essential. You want hematology, um, your obst obstetrician, anesthesiology. Really, it's essential to have this kind of multidisciplinary approach to ensure the best outcomes for the mother and the child. And again, I can't emphasize enough that you should know your risks. And if you don't know your risks or you're unsure of your risks, to work with your healthcare provider to identify all your potential risk factors and steps that you can take to reduce your risk. In addition to knowing your risks and working with your healthcare provider, you also need to know the signs and symptoms of a deep vein thrombosis and a pulmonary embolism. Remember that study I shared with you about the 180 patients who got blood clots? The most common presentation for the DVT was, left lower, was lower leg pain and lower leg swelling. So if you find yourself with uh, leg pain, leg swelling, suddenly skin discoloration, redness, tenderness, those might be signs of a deep vein thrombosis and you should seek medical attention. In addition, if you have chest pain or chest pressure or shortness of breath or your heart is beating really fast, 
that might be symptoms of a blood clot in the lungs, the pulmonary embolism, and again, you wanna seek medical attention. So I just wanna end with thrombophilia, like I said, is an inherited or acquired condition that predisposes individuals to developing blood clots. Some of those inherited risk factors carry a high risk of developing a blood clot, like the antitrombin deficiency, and others carry a low risk. Pregnancy is an added risk factor, and we spoke about the importance of knowing additional risk factors. And we spoke about managing pregnancy in women who have thrombophilia. We reviewed the signs and symptoms of a blood clot, deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism, and really to seek medical attention if you were to develop any of these. And lastly, it is entirely possible for you to have a successful and healthy pregnancy, even if you have a thrombophilia, by working closely with your providers and a multidisciplinary team. So this leads me to introduce the next part of this, my patient, Kate, and I am so honored that she agreed to speak with you all today and with me. And I have to say, it has been an absolute pleasure to be your doctor. And I will not lie, we did have some challenges that she will share, but by working together and her being so acutely aware of her body and risks, she not only had one successful pregnancy, but she had two. And so, of course, I did tell her I will have a heart attack if she tells me she wants to get pregnant again. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but um, <Not> yet. Kate, <laughs> um, thank you so much for being here and thank you for sharing your story. Yes, absolutely. My pleasure. Um, thank you for having me on this platform to tell my story on such an important topic and one that's become so close to my heart after living through two pregnancies with clotting. Um, I feel like I'm an expert, but not really. <laughs> um, so back in 2015, my husband and I were interested in starting to plan for a family. Um, I made an appointment with Dr. Rozowski to go over my risk because my father um, had a significant clotting history, both provoked clots and unprovoked clots, and had been on therapeutic Globinox for years. So I knew based on being my chance of being pregnant, as well as my family history, that I could um, have an increased risk for clotting. Um, it was there at that appointment, she realized that yes, I do have an increased risk and I warrant a uh, prophylactic dose of Globinox once I reached 13 weeks gestation. So I ended up getting pregnant in May of 2016. Um, and just a little bit of background information, I was 30 years old at the time. Um, I considered myself like very healthy, no major me past medical history, never had any surgeries, never had any blood clots. Um, I like really enjoyed exercising and running and I was not, you know, I was very active. So I thought like pregnancy is gonna be a breeze, like even if it's, you know, I'm being cautious, I'm gonna be on like the prophylactic dose, it's gonna go fine. And uh, up until 20 weeks, it was very smooth. Um, I was still able to, you know, like run and exercise, do everything I wanted to do. Like back then I was walking to and from work, um, never had a lot of nausea. I just was like, this pregnancy is a breeze, you know, and I'm going to just cruise on by and it'd be great. Um, then around 20 weeks, um, it was obviously my first pregnancy. I hadn't even really popped yet. Like no one really knew I was that pregnant. Um, I started feeling significant back pain. Um, it wasn't all the time, it was intermittent and I couldn't really tell like what was triggering it. So I kind of thought to myself like, okay, maybe I'm just being too active. I'm gonna stop running and see how things go, see if it gets better. Um, by 24 weeks, I kind of expressed to my OB that I just like kind of felt uncomfortable at times. You know, my when I was explaining myself, I sounded very vague, but it, you know, it wasn't the type of pain that would, you know, hinder my daily activities. I still worked, I still like exercised lightly. It just became increasingly uncomfortable, mostly in my left lower back. Um, so, you know, like I did what any other common pregnant first time mother would do. I asked my village of mothers, like, did you have back pain when you were pregnant? Like, what did you do about it? So I started getting like prenatal massages and uh, sleeping with a pillow between my legs. And, you know, all the while I knew that I had a risk for blood clots, but I was on Movenox and I was, you know, being careful and staying hydrated. And the pain um, 
started to increase and become more frequent. And I all can, came to a head the week of Thanksgiving. Um, I had three busy days at work, like more than 12 hours each day on my feet for long periods of time. And I remember thinking to myself, I was 28 weeks pregnant. I'm like, I don't think that I'm going to be able to work my whole pregnancy. Like I was trying to find places to lay down because I felt like that was the only time that I got any relief. And I was like, I, I must be a wimp because, you know, this is pretty painful. And um, so I got through those three days. I was heading home to New York to like spend the holidays with my parents and my family. And I was looking forward to that. Ended up driving um, to my parents' house. It was roughly like three hours after my last work day. And by the time I got to my parents' house, I was just like in a lot of pain. And uh, my mom thought it was unusual because I usually am not much of a complainer. And she was like, well, why don't you take a hot shower? Like I'll rub your back, you know, we'll try and get you comfortable. Um, and it was at that point, I went up to take a shower, uh, got undressed and I saw that my left leg was completely blue. And right then, um, all the, you know, maybe this is a pulled muscle, maybe the baby's sitting on the, like a nerve or something. All those hypotheses that I had in my head, like immediately went away. I was like, I have a blood clot. <laughs> so it was the night before Thanksgiving. I went to this small community hospital um, who didn't even have a person to come in to do an ultrasound on me. So, um, they transferred me to a, like a major medical center. Um, they did an ultrasound on my leg. They couldn't find a clot, but something about my, my story and my back pain and the, the, the coloring of my leg led them to believe that, you know, I definitely have a clot. They put me on a heparin drip right away. And, um, I actually called Dr. Rosowski <laughs> from, from out of state. And I was like, I just need help, you know, um, and she was so great. She kind of led my care, um, was able to get me an MRI and that's where my DVT was found. It was an iliac and the fem common femoral vein. So spent two nights at that hospital, got discharged and bridged to Lovenox, um, which is like the self injections. Uh, it just increased my dose to a therapeutic level. And uh, I was like, okay, I'm gonna take a week off of work uh, I'm really going to rest and relax and hydrate and, you know, just kind of like lay low for a bit. So, uh, as the week went by, you know, I was like getting kind of bored. Um, but I felt like, wow, like DVTs are so painful. I can't believe people like live with these every day. Um, and I just felt like the pain wasn't getting any better. It was getting worse, but um, I knew that I was using my vacation week from work. I was using my vacation time and I wanted to get back to work because I wanted to use that vacation time when I have the baby. So I went back to work the next week, um, made it through Monday, but felt completely terrible. And then Tuesday, I was like, okay, I just have to make it through Tuesday because Wednesday and Thursday I have off. And, you know, I kind of like mentally got myself through it. But then um, Tuesday night, I was leaving work. And um, I work at a hospital, so <laughs> I was leaving work and I was just thinking to myself, I'm like, I don't know how I'm gonna be able to like walk from the hospital to get a cab. Like I couldn't even think, I was in so much pain, I couldn't even walk. And luckily a security guard <laughs> thought that I was in labor by the way I was walking out of the hospital. So he got me a wheelchair and he like wheeled me to the emergency room. I didn't even have it in my head that I was going to go to the emergency room, but thank God he just like shoved me in there because um, it, it had come to find out that my clot had grown um, basically in the groin. It had grown, it had grown through the whole left leg in every visualized calf vein there was. So it like had grown significantly exponentially over that past week, which I was like, now I know why I was in so much pain this whole time. Um, so there I was, I spent a couple more nights at Mass General. Um, they increased my woven off, got my blood a little bit thinner, and then I was able to go home. 
So I spent the next eight weeks just kind of at home. Um, I ended up getting a little bit more relief once I increased my Lovenox dosing. Um, I never had any more further issues with clotting uh, during that pregnancy, but finished my you know, pregnancy without working on bed rest. Um, and I have to admit that was probably the worst part of the whole experience is being at home, not having a lot of distractions and thinking in my head every worst case scenario that could happen <laughs> while being on blood thinners and not knowing how the delivery was going to go. And partially this was, you know, because I was a first time mother and not knowing what to expect with the delivery and all of that. But um, I ended up being induced at 41 weeks. Um, I transitioned to heparin at 36 weeks for the shorter acting uh, anticoagulant um, and was able to deliver a healthy baby boy uh, two days later once I was induced. My labor lasted a long time. So there was no blood thinners left in my body at that time. Um, and uh, yeah, I have a very healthy baby boy. Um, so that pregnancy was probably the most traumatic in the fact that I didn't think that I was in a clot from the beginning and I did clot and then it got a lot bigger and I wasn't ready for that. I wasn't expecting to be on bed rest, um, but I was also it made me prepared for my second pregnancy, which I, some people still think I'm crazy to have another baby after that. <laughs> but, um, so two years later, um, Dr. Rosaski and I came up with a plan that once I became pregnant again, I would go on an intermediate dose of Lovenox, uh, 40 milligrams at night and 40 milligrams uh, in the morning. Um, and I did pretty well on that up until 24 weeks in which I started to get back pain and I knew right away, like I'm not gonna waste my time or anyone else's time, but I'm, so I called my doctor right away, got a scan and I had a uh, acute clot there again. Um, so immediately went to a thera therapeutic level dosing and it never became occlusive, which was probably the reason why I uh, didn't have as much pain, um, but ended up having a pretty successful pregnancy. Um, although I had a C-section um, for my second son, which was not planned, <laughs> but um, his position was wrong and I couldn't push him out. So ended up having a C-section. And then with the C-section, I was, I was definitely crushed by, because Dr. Rosaski and I talked about the increased risk of having clots after a C-section, and it was definitely not in my plan to have a C-section. I remember like yelling at the doctor, like, no, just let me push two more hours. Like, I just got to do it. But I ended up having a C-section. And luckily, postpartum with both pregnancies, I did not have any clotting problems. Both pregnancies, I was started on Lovenox pretty quickly after, um, and uh, you know, a very traumatic experience. But I have two very healthy baby boys now, and um, I had a, a great healthcare team. I ended up switching to from a regular OB to a high risk OB, um, and Dr. Rosowski was very um, much a had a huge impact on both of my pregnancies. And I, I'm like so thankful for her. <laughs> well, wow. Thank you so much for sharing that story. And thank you. I know it was very, very challenging. I, I think, um, you know, I think it just, uh, it speaks to a lot of things. One is, you know, your body really well and knew kind of when something was wrong. Um, I think, um, you know, when, um, when we first started you, Oftentimes, you know, because because of you, one thing I mentioned is you, your dad did have, you know, four blood clots before the age of 50. So he was one of those high risk. So actually, when you first got pregnant, we started you on blood thinner right away and then had some bleeding issues. So we that so when you got pregnant, that that's why we kind of waited till that 13 week right. period. Um, usually in somebody at high risk, we start we do start right away. And that's kind of also when we did the lower dose initially, the second one. But I, I have to say, um, I think I get. I guess um, first of all, that was just a beautiful story of sharing all that, and I, I and your 
you don't even do service of how amazing you were through this entire thing. And I, I think the message is that you can have a pregnancy and even with challenges, uh, you can get through it successfully um, with it, with a great team and a lot of people um, taking care of you. And, and just, you know, Kate, when things went wrong, you would call me and we would figure out how to, you know, how to solve it. And we did, um, I guess, you know, um, every, every person is, is different and needs to work with their healthcare to determine kind of, you know, best approach. But um, I just, I want to know for you, like just in people that are listening to this, you know, what was the most helpful thing for you during kind of these trying times? What, what helped you the most? Um, so I think that, um, society puts a lot of pressure on women to like be a fantastic mom and have a great career and, you know, get pregnant, but also work up until 40 weeks. And when I got a blood clot and I really had to really evaluate my like thought of how my pregnancy was going to go, it really forced me to like step back and be like, I should be lucky I'm pregnant. <laughs> I had to really reframe my uh, thinking about it all because, um, you know, I just had this thought in my head that like I was going to breeze through pregnancy and I was going to like bounce back after and it was going to be no problem. And, um, you know, those eight weeks that I was on bed rest for were really difficult because like I just thought of everything that like could potentially happen. But each day my husband was like, hey, like, let's just be happy. Like we're having a baby and like, you are at, you're like, we live in Boston and you have this great healthcare team. And like, he really helped me when I was in a dark place, uh, really re, re, rechange like my mind and my thinking, which is honestly so important to me, like to have that supportive partner. Um, so that's kind of like what helped me get through it. Yeah, 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 and I, I will say that your husband is very supportive, <laughs> having known both of you for a long time. Yeah, um, and I, I really appreciate you saying that about the working because um, you were so committed to working, and it was just really I know how hard it was for you to to not work, and I think um, and and that was hard. And I think thinking about you know what was really important for your health and the baby's health and just, um, you know, again, thinking about, okay, where are my priorities and getting through it? And, and you did. And, um, you know, here you are with. I think it's kids. also important to note that like, this was my first time thinking of not just myself. Like I had to be reminded, like, like you're going to stay home and you're going to rest because you're caring for your child already type of thing. Like you're not thinking for yourself. You're thinking for two. Um, so it's just a change in mindset, really. Yeah, yeah. And if you, um, if there are women out, out listening right now, um, what piece of advice, um, you talked about what was most helpful for you, you know, thinking, you know, changing your mindset, what piece of advice um, would you, would you give them that would help them through this in addition to what you've already said? Yeah. So, um, I think like, honestly, what helped me the most through this was like having a very supportive team. Um, I remember like calling Dr. Wazowski, like at all different times of the day, <laughs> like being like, you know, can we check my anti 10 a level? Like my, I've had like frequent nosebleeds or, and just having that, um, feeling of feeling supported with your healthcare team, you know, like shop around, see who's in your area see what doctor you feel most comfortable with. I think that like gave me a lot of reassurance going forward. And even with the delivery that I, it might, I might not know what it's going to look like with the delivery, but I know that I have a great team that it's going to get me through it. Even if I don't like the way it's going, like we're going to get through it and it's going to be okay kind of thing. So like find a doctor that you really gel with that you can ask questions that you can be yourself with and um, I think that's super important. Yeah, yeah, I, I could not, um, uh, I absolutely could not agree with you more about that. <laughs> that yeah. was, um, because, you, you know, it's really important. This is such a challenging time that you absolutely have to feel comfortable um, with the people taking care of you and, and, and absolutely be able to be yourself and ask your questions and really share your vulnerabilities 
um, you know, Kate, um, and I would cry, <laughs> cry a lot. Um, so just, yeah. you know, don't, don't be afraid of that. This is, you know, this is, this is really important. Um, Leslie, you're on to other questions. Hi, yes, we actually do have a couple questions, which I'm going to read to you folks and you can um, answer them. Um, is natural labor possible on thinners or is C-section better? Is C-section better than natural labor? Yes. Um, well, I think, um, so I think whether, uh, uh, so I think it's a, that, that's um, a question, a, a, an important question. So if you are somebody that's on a blood thinner because you've had a blood clot and you're thinking about how to go through the delivery, um, I think that's a, a, a conversation I would have with your hematologist, uh, obstetrician, anesthesiologist to figure out again, what is going to be the safest way for you? And typically when people um, go into labor, if they're on the Lovenox shots, um, we'll have them stop it as soon as they start to feel that contraction. Um, with Kate, we did switch her to from low make white heparin to Lovenox um, to an unfractioned heparin, which is a shorter half-life. So it's, it's um, shorter, mostly because if you're gonna get an epidural, there has to be a certain amount of time from when you took that shot. In addition, I think the reason it's a good idea to not um, be on the blood thinner throughout the pregnancy, you know, during the childbirth is you really don't know what might happen, right? So even if you think you are gonna be being able to do this naturally, you may end up needing an emergent surgery or C-section or something like that. So that's why we really don't want women on the blood thinners um, at the time that they are going through labor because we just don't know. I think whether natural or C-section, you know, I can't really answer that question because it really depends on kind of the other risk factors that are going on with you, the other complications, the other medical problems you might have. So again, that is why it's so important to have a multidisciplinary team of people. Um, and then, you know, oftentimes if, if somebody's had, um, you know, a lot of issues, we might schedule a C-section, we might schedule an induction, um, you know, so, so those are things to talk about too. But in general, it's not, we, we, if, if possible, we don't want people on full dose blood thinner when they are actually delivering just because if there's those complications and we need to do something urgently, so it's nice not to be um, on a full dose blood thinner. Okay. Um, is a pregnancy considered to be high risk if you've had a pulmonary embolism before? Yeah, so, the, so um, uh, Anytime you've ever had a blood clot, you're always at risk of having another blood clot. So if you've had a pulmonary embolism, um, regardless if it's provoked or unprovoked, you're at risk for having another one. So if it's a provoked blood clot and it was provoked not because of anything related to estrogen, let's say you broke a leg and you were in a cast and you got a blood clot because of that. Um, that is considered a provoked blood clot and your chances of getting another blood clot pretty low unless again, you have a family history or these other risk factors. And in that situation, I would say, you know, prophylax in high clotting risk situations. I think if you've had a major uh, blood clot, it, it certainly um, does increase your risk of getting a blood clot when you're pregnant, especially if you got a blood clot when you were on estrogen. So if you got a blood clot when you were taking an oral contraceptive and it had estrogen in it, then absolutely you're gonna be at a much higher risk of getting a blood clot um, when you get pregnant. And you can think about how much estrogen when you're pregnant, right? <laughs> I mean, it's much more than what's in the pill. So in that situation, you absolutely need to be on a blood thinner. The question is what dose and do you have the, um, and um, if you've had a blood clot um, in the past because of being on estrogen, that is an indication to be on a blood thinner during the pregnancy and after, not just after. And then again, the dose is going to depend, depend on what your other risks are. Sometimes it's a prophylactic dose. Sometimes it's that intermediate dose. Sometimes it's a high dose. Um, so um, that really, again, depends on your, your personal risk. But if you've had a blood clot in the past, that absolutely does put you at a higher risk of getting a blood clot if you get pregnant. And that's important to share with your healthcare provider to figure out the best approach to get you through the pregnancy safely. Okay, great. Uh, also, could you clarify what the different types of thrombophilia are and what was Kate's diagnosis? Well, Kate, do you want to share that? <laughs> so, um, I just was positive for factor V Latin, which is the most common. Um, and it's 
a lot of the population has it and won't, will never have a blood clot or a DVT. Um, so my father's history, he's positive for factor V blood and, and I, I'm not sure the other one, I think there's one more, um, maybe you can. Yeah, yeah. So there's, so at this point, there's five inherited risk factors that we know about. One is factor five Leiden. That's the most common one. About one in 20 people will have that. But Kate is right. Most people will do just fine and not have any blood clots. Um, the times that we do see those people getting blood clot is in high clotting risk situations. Having factor five Leiden in and of itself doesn't cause a blood clot. It just puts you at a higher risk in high clotting risk situations. The second one is the prothrombin gene mutation, and that's about one in 50 um, have that. Mm -hmm. um, the third one is the protein C deficiency, and that's about maybe one in 200 to one in 500 people get that. There's also one called protein S deficiency. We actually don't know how prevalent that is in the general population. Then the last one we talked about is the antithrombin deficiency. That's about one in maybe 600 to one in 5,000. And kind of the lower risk ones that, that factor five widen. But you know, for, for Kate, and it also depends on whether you have one risk or more than one risk. So sometimes people can have factor five widen and a prothrombin gene mutation. That's called a combination one or combined one. Or sometimes if you got one risk from your mom and one from your dad, you could have two for the factor five widen. That puts you at a much higher risk. So it's a little bit complicated for that. But I would say, you know, family history is as important, maybe even more important um, than, than knowing what these five are. You know, Kate has factor five Leiden. Like I said, that's pretty, that's, that's one of the considered low risk ones usually compared to like antithrombin deficiency. But her dad had five, you know, four blood clots before the age of 50. So, you know, for her, to me, that seems like a, a high clotting risk situation for her. And we didn't go into the, the first time we put, we put Kate on low knox, but uh, you know, so, so that, so her, to me, that was like, well, that was really high risk. And as soon as she got pregnant the first time, I was like, you are on a blood thinner. Um, so I think knowing your family history as well as what, what these, um, what these are. And like I mentioned is um, oftentimes I'll have family members that have, um, you know, I have a patient that have a lot of family members that have had blood clots and their testing is negative. I'm still concerned about that person. I'm not going to say, oh yeah, you're fine. You don't need anything because if they've had their own blood clot or they have a family history of blood clots or multiple family, that's the person I'm going to talk about. Okay. Do you need to be on a blood thinner? Let's take a look at your other risks. Like take a look at what happened. You know, if I have a patient that says, oh yeah, you know, my twin sister died of a PE, you know, when she was 25, well, that's something I'm going to be really worried about, right? Even if their testing is negative. So you really got to take a family history into account too. Okay, we'll take one more question and then um, we've actually run uh, over quite a bit, but this is great because people are sending in their questions and I'm quite interested. Uh, what are the risks associated with conception and FFV in late 30s and early 40s? I'm sorry, say that again. What are the risks associated with conception and FFV in late 30s and early 40s? I actually wonder if they mean IVF, perhaps? I think they mean IVF, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Or is it factor five widen? Oh, oh, is it oh okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> here. Okay. So, what is the risk of uh, factor five widen and what was it and IVF? What are the risks associated with conception in FFV in late 30s and early 40s? Oh, okay. I see what you're asking. Um, so, uh, as you get older, um, your risks of having, you know, miscarriages, let's say, um, go go up. Um, and so there is, um, when people, there, the literature around um, these thrombophilic defects and their effects on, let's say, miscarriages or, or inability to get pregnant are a little bit all over the place. Um, but what I would say is um, I wouldn't, in people that have, they're just trying to get pregnant and they're in their 30s and they have factor five Leiden, would just go ahead and try to get pregnant. If you end up not getting pregnant or you end up having numerous miscarriages, especially either late miscarriages, late stage miscarriages, um, meeting with a hematologist to figure out whether or not it's appropriate to put you on th something I think would be important. Again, the literature that's out there is, is a little bit controversial. Some, some say, some literature suggests, yes, there's a benefit. Some suggest there's absolutely no benefit. So it's not a straightforward answer because there's not really a straightforward um, 
uh, evidence to support one way or the other, but you're somebody that I would, you know, definitely talk with your OB and, and your hematologist about kind of what your other risks are and whether or not you need to be on anything. Um, if you've ever had a blood clot, again, have you ever, if you have a personal history of blood clot, you have a family history of blood clot, extensive family history of blood clot, if you have other risk factors, and that's going to play into whether or not you need to be on a blood thinner and when and what goes. Okay, great. Thank you. So, wow, what an amazing discussion. Uh, thank you both, Kate, for sharing your story. Dr. Rosofsky, for all of your information. We're so thankful to have both of you here today. Um, and we also want to thank Ripples for their sponsorship of this event and their support of the National Blood Club Alliance. And also to let everyone know, we have um, new uh, video content on thrombophilia and pregnancy uh, on the website, stoptheplot.org. So encourage everyone to go to our website to watch that video. Uh, it's incredibly informative and um, interesting. And once again, Kate, thank you. Congratulations on uh, your two children. And Dr. Zossi, thank you as well. Absolutely. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.